this one. Now that's, that's good. I'll start there. Yes. You're, you're live. Okay. Yeah. Well, good morning. We'll we want to go ahead and. Uh, start class um, we are in lesson 11 we do have a new handout this morning yeah. so before we get started let's have uh, I am the from what let's have a word of prayer loving father in heaven we thank Michael for giving us this day this time, Father, that we can be in Bible study. We thank you, Father, for your word and its perfect guidance to our lives. And we ask you, Father, to help us work through this particular aspect of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This morning, as we look at gifts that have been given and are given to each Christian Father, we pray that we would be able to ascertain how those are a blessing to us and that each of us is given a gift to make stronger the body as a whole. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the inspiration of Scripture. We thank you for your love. So in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so... Uh, we do have a new handout this morning, and um, as I said in the prayer, we're going to be looking at the gifts, not the gift, but the gifts themselves. Um, as a reminder to us all, uh, we've already examined that the um, gift of the Spirit was promised to all who repent and are baptized. That's found in Acts 2. And it's in your handout under introduction, slide number two, um, Acts chapter two, verse 38 and 39. Um, this refers to the Spirit Himself. And we want to make sure that that's clear in our minds. As John tells us in chapter seven, there in verse 39, but this He spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in Him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And then Acts 5 and verse 32, I think is just as clear as it can be. And that is, and we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Again, that's the reference to those who would repent and are baptized and are added to the kingdom in Acts 2 and verse 47. So the pertaining of the unwelling of the spirit in the church and in the Christian um, as a reminder to us where we've been, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16 says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? I think said a little clearer in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, Paul again says this, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Uh, I don't know how that can be any clearer of whom you have from God and you are not your own. So that brings me then, uh, after all these different subjects that we have looked at, and you may not have realized it, but uh, this is what we've done so far. It's about uh, two inches of material. And... Um, we still have this lesson and two more after it um, that we will be looking at as the last slide on your paperwork says next time we will be looking at or lesson 12 will be sins against the spirit and we have already looked at briefly that we can grieve the spirit um, we're going to look at the aspect of that grieving or that um, the, that rebellion on our part that results in sin. The Bible also speaks, though, of gifts. And these gifts are what we're going to focus on in this particular lesson. Um, if you like to write down the names of some of the commentators that I have used, I have this um, material in um, what will be the library. Um, 
Brandon was able to work on it this last week. Uh, ceiling's been repaired, walls have been repainted. It looks nice in there. So, F.F. Um, Bruce, F.F. Bruce, in his commentary on the book of Acts, he, he makes this quote statement. And it revolves around 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. Let me read the text and then I'll read the quote. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11, it says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things. And we're going to look at verses 12 or chapter 12, 1 through uh, 11 in more detail as the lesson goes on. But verse 11 but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So the Spirit knows what the needs are of the church. And so He will distribute as He sees the need to each and every one of us that is repentant, baptized, part of the kingdom. This is what Bruce said about this verse. We must distinguish the gift of the Spirit from the gifts of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit is the Spirit Himself, bestowed by the Father through the Messiah. And gifts of the Spirit are those spiritual faculties which the Spirit imparts, dividing to each one severely, even as He will. And so we are going to be looking at the expression that is found in the Greek of Tavanumanitika. It means spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. In verse Corinthians 12, verse 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Then he's going to go on through verse uh, 11. But listen to this. You know that you were Gentiles. That's very specific. They weren't raised Jews. They are from the other side of the track, they would say. They are not of the seed of Abraham. They would be like you and I. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. However, you were led. Talking about how the Spirit leads us to understand and then we always have a choice. It's the choice. Follow or turn away from. Verse 3. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit and that coincides with verse 11. Uh, verse 5, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. So we can identify clearly with that. Um, there's a host of things that uh, goes on in ministry. You know, we have edification, we have evangelism, and we have um, fellowship amongst one another, brotherly contact and edification with each other. So they're different. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So, you know, there used to be this thought that uh, I read about that so the spiritual gifts were for the individual as they could live and breathe in the world. But that's not true. They're actually for the benefit of of the church. Yes, they'll benefit the individual, but it's for the church. For the one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy to another discerning spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues in verse 11 as we already looked at it. Not but one and the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now what we need to realize is, is that the spiritual gifts, here's a foretaste of what I'll develop. 
And that is that they have ceased to exist. They have ceased to exist. And so when we begin to look at the gifts as they are talking about, talk about, they are for our common good. Um, you ever heard somebody say, that brother's got the gift of gab? Okay? Or, or that brother's got the gift of edification. Or that sister's got the gift of peace. Could be a brother. But these gifts, they manifest themselves in different ways. And so this is what we're going to be looking at. And I want to answer basically four questions. Here's my four questions that I've developed. What were the spiritual gifts? I just read those. How did people receive the spiritual gifts? What was the purpose of the spiritual gifts? That needs to be clarified. And how long were the spiritual gifts to last? So before we delve into verses 8 through 11 that talks about the spiritual gifts, comments or questions, there is a new handout for those of you that just came in, okay? To make sure it is a new one. So I hope that's beneficial to you. Um, here, here's another quote. This one is by the Expositor's Bible Commentary author, Richard Longnecker. He is not a member of the church, but I think what he has to say is worthy. Uh, many of you have heard me use the expression catfish theology. I believe there's something good that you can get from most commentators. You just have to take enough time to look at it, discern it, filter it from the Bible, the Bible, to know whether or not it's something you should keep, swallow like catfish, or spit out like bones that you find in a catfish. Here's what he says. The gift is the spirit himself given to the men to minister the saving benefits of Christ's redemption to the believer. While the gifts are those spiritual abilities the spirit gives variously to believers for the common good and sovereignly because he has the right to do so, just as he determined, Peter's promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit is a logical outcome of repentance and baptism. And so again, the emphasis being on the reality that we are talking about gifts that are given to the Christian. Did you get a chance to get a handout? There was a new handout. Sorry I didn't catch you before you sat down. Um, well, let's deal with the first question. This will be at the top. This will be slide number three. Slide number three. What were the spiritual gifts? Now, this particular topic is going to be slides three, four, and five. Now, I've already read this, but I want to embellish it a little bit. And what I want to do is identify these nine spiritual gifts that are talked about. And I was raised, I told you this, I was raised in a denominational background. Was taught the gospel, obeyed the gospel, and realized that I had been lied to. Because I was actually told early on in my youth that... Um, if I did not speak in tongues, then I was not saved. And that if I did not have spiritual knowledge, then I was not a child of the kingdom. I was taught a lot of different things that were not true. But what I have discovered is, is that not all of us may get all nine of these, but in fact, as described by Paul, when we read about these nine, we begin to understand what they really are. The word of wisdom, the ability to speak new revelations of divine wisdom. Paul had this ability. But today there is no new revelations. We have everything that we need complete in God's word as it is written. 
Paul would say it this way in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Turn with me there. And what we do is we find our way to verse 6. And Paul says this to us. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Did, did you hear how scaly that was? Mm -hmm. Paul is saying even the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, all these different divisions that had developed, he is saying there that they did not have this knowledge, this wisdom. And you cannot impart something that you don't have. The rest of verse 8. They would, have crucified, they would not have crucified the Lord. Verse 9. As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now that's a quote from Isaiah 64 in verse 4. You'll remember Isaiah, he, uh, as a prophet of God, wrote God's will down 700 years before Jesus was in the Lord. Wednesday night, when Brother Danny was talking about how the angel Gabriel had come from the presence of God, and he came and he spoke not only to Zacharias, but he also spoke to Mary. He called her Blessed One. Both of them were startled by the fact that they were being approached, but the reality is, is that Mary said, I am your servant. And she was able to do the will of God, bringing Jesus into the world when the Spirit of God came upon her. Verse 10 says, But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. Is the Spirit important? Absolutely. Absolutely. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Everything God wants us to know is this word of wisdom. And we have all of that revealed to us in his word. And it is preserved for us even to this day. And it's fascinating to look at how God is preserved. Um, when I was taking uh, Greek and uh, biblical languages in school. I remember us going to a scriptorium and at the scriptorium they had all of these codexes and these are uh, writings of the first century what we have now translated into English. Many of them were originally in Hebrew or Aramaic and then they were translated into Greek in the Septuagint. And these writings, they were preserved. And what's fascinating is one of the oldest pieces of the Gospel of John is dated within 150 years of Jesus living on the earth. At least that's the one that I got to visit and look at and struggle with as I looked at because see in my Greek Bible my letters are all in lowercase. When you look at all of these manuscripts and lectionaries and unseals as they're called, uh, these complete packages of God's Word they're all in capitals. So if you don't recognize capital letters in Greek it might be difficult for you. But I want you to think about these men that Jesus chose. He chose them not because of their abilities. He chose them because of what they were going to become and how their hearts and their lives were going to change. Peter, for example, we know was, well, he's a little impetuous.
when he was younger in his relationship with Jesus, but then he finally realized who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And he became one of the powerful speakers of the of the apostles. Paul, who was chosen by Jesus on that road to Damascus. Paul, who would be responsible for writing some 16 of the New Testament <coughs> books. The words of wisdom that God would reveal to him through the Holy Spirit he preserved for us so that we have them. But there's nothing new to that. We have everything that we need. In fact, if you want to turn there, let me just show you this real quick. In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, I know you all recognize this. I forgot I put a marker there. If you want to embarrass Hunter, um, this was given to me when he was in the elementary class. <laughs> That's precious to me. Yeah. Um, it says, God, verse 1, um, God who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds who being in the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Turn to the Gospel of John for a moment. And in the Gospel of John, there in verse 1, or chapter 1 of verse 1, you remember that it says this about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Then you drop down to verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So now we know that that reference to the Word, that reference that was in Hebrews, that reference in verse 1, we're talking about Jesus. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this Word of wisdom, that was needed for a time, but it is no longer. And then we have our second spiritual gift, and that is the word of knowledge. How is work knowledge different than wisdom? Knowledge is just facts. Okay. Uh, information. Okay. Wisdom um, is applied. Okay. What is? Wisdom is applied. Okay. So I might know a lot of things. For example, uh, I don't have to break down a uh, M16. Uh, I was taught and drilled many times on even how to do it in the dark. Mm -hmm. So that if I was ever in a situation where I had to do that in the dark, that I would be able to do it. Um, I've actually had to do that in the dark. Um, if I didn't have the knowledge of it, I wouldn't have been able to execute that. And so I took the knowledge and I turned it into action. To action. The wisdom that you have. Um, you remember when you went to driver's ed? How many of you took driver's ed, by the way? Okay. See, you know, I really think that that's an important step for young people before they go out on the road. Um, but it's not as often done today as it used to be. Uh, by the way, I failed my first driver's test. <laughs> you know, I was living in this town for several years. Um, I, I knew the intersections well. Um, there was this little cafe and we all went to the cafe and we waited our turn and the highway patrolman would come in and he would call your name and you would go out, get in your vehicle. He would get in the passenger seat. He would watch you set your mirrors and do a backing out and get started. He would take you down to the next intersection and he would have you, you could either go left and go around the courthouse. A lot of young people went around the courthouse. I don't know, it was just a thing we did on Friday nights. Um, <laughs> and um, 
yelling in out the windows at each other anyway but you could turn right there and when you turned right it went by the movie theater and the um the store where you got the medicine i say store because they also had one of those counters where you could sit at and you could get an ice cream float and all those kind of things it was one of those lovely little settings anyway i get to the next intersection and um it was a red light and i turned right now, if you know anything about the state of Texas, you can turn right on the red. But not on the right side of the street, on the left side of the street. There was a sign that said, no right turn. And so I turned right, and he looked at me, and he said, really? Go back to the restaurant. You failed. <laughs> My mom and dad are sitting in there, all excited, because I'm going to be a new driver. And... Uh, I walk in the door and I'm looking kind of pitiful and my dad goes, what did you do? <laughs> and I said, I turned right on red head around, around the corner. He says, yeah, the sign's on the left side of the street. You never noticed that? Anyway, I didn't execute my whiz with wisdom that day. I failed. Knowledge is the ability to speak truths. Truths already revealed. So, Look at 1 Corinthians 14 with me. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 6. It says, and this is Paul again writing, he says, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Well, what's interesting is, is that Paul is making the point here, if he's going to speak, he needs to speak what? Clearly. Understandably. So that it's not, as he puts here, a new revelation, uh, something that is by knowledge, something that is by prophecy, or something that needs to be taught. He, he's pointing out here it needs to be clear it needs to be established this is the word of knowledge the ability to speak truths already revealed mm -hmm. by the time Paul is writing all these things people are beginning to understand who Jesus was because of how he lived and how he died which brings us then to the next one if you were to ask most people who go to, watch my fingers, who go to church, if they have faith, you know what most of them will say? Faith. Do they have faith? Yeah, most of them will say I have faith. Uh, so if you ask them, so what is your faith in? What is our faith in? Jesus Christ, Him crucified, resurrected from the grave, ascended to the right hand of the Father. He has fulfilled God's will to make a pathway for us to make it back to eternity, not to be sent to everlasting torment because we have no way of atoning for our sins. Jesus became the atonement. Faith. Not saving faith, but things that you understand. But faith to perform as it is here. What people believe was a faith to perform miracles. What kind of miracles? Miracles. Okay, raise the dead. Jesus did that. John 11. Heal the sick. Okay, heal the sick. Okay, diseases. Okay. Okay, uh, a few a few pieces of fish and some bread, and we wind up feeding uh, uh, four thousand in one location, five thousand in another. By the way, I, I think I taught you all this. Um, the the reality in um, um, the historical aspects of looking back at when those things would have been done, mm -hmm. um, we begin to realize that um, that there there, there were. When they counted, they only counted the men. 
So, you know, if somebody were to say, so, so how is Bible class? You know, some would just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We had seven in Bible class. Well, what about all you ladies? You see, the historical aspect of it was the magnitude of feeding 4,000, the magnitude of feeding 5,000 is, is that there would have been an average of, and, and I'm going to round it up because it sounds silly to say 2.3 uh, people, but if you take that 15,001 and 12,000 and another, now is that impressive? With a few fish and a couple of pieces of bread. It is impressive. It is impressive. And they took up baskets of leftovers. Um, just amazing miracles to believe that they're possible. First Corinthians 13, 2 says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith, faith to believe that miracles are possible, so that I could move mountains. Or remove mountains, excuse me. Remember when Jesus talked about that? If you had faith, you could say to this mountain, move and it would. That's what he's pointing out here. So that I could remove mountains, but have not love by nothing. And that's going to lead us towards verse 13 in that chapter where we learn about love being the greatest of all of the gifts. Mark 11, words of Jesus. Significant. It says there, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, will have whatever he says. So let's use the example here. So if I were to ask all of you, do you have faith? The answer is most likely going to be yes. Do you have faith? To say to the Atlantic Ocean, dry up. No, you have doubt about that. Okay. Um, the reality is, is that even if you had all the faith in the world, and even if you thought you could say it and it would happen, but you still don't love in your heart the souls of humanity. Paul uh, speaks in 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus speaks in Mark chapter 11. And goes on to him, teach us that we are in the book of Jonah. Jonah teaches that the lesson pretty well. So you've got Jonah, four chapters. You know, Jonah runs away from God. Jonah has a uh, come to God moment. He's going to head back because he's taken back by the fish. He gets spit out on the shore. He's motivated because of that's an incredible thing that he just went through. That, that's a miracle in itself. He goes to Nineveh and he tells them to repent. And what happens? And then what happens to Job? He gets mad because God's miracle to straighten his attitude out and God would work through him. I don't know which he was madder at, the fact that the Ninevites were so horrible or that God would use him to speak to the Ninevites. I think it was a little bit of both. But definitely the Ninevites were allowed to be saved and they were just terrible. And your further point was, well, I wanted to give that background. Sure. I, it was a, a hard lesson for me because a lot of times I see people as John sees the Ninevites, but that's not how God sees them. And so, after the Ninevites repent, what does Jonah do? You remember? There, there, there's Bush. Uh, but he has some shade, okay? A little bit of humiliation, okay? I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to take it away. You ever felt like you've gotten something and then it's taken away, and what was you? What were you supposed to learn from it? 
You ever have those moments? I have these moments in the shop all the time. So I have this van out there that is uh, my uh, learning van. I'm going to make a sign and put on it. Learning bin. It has all my mistakes in it. So uh, I go to I go to the wood store and I buy all these particular kinds of wood. I prep all these kinds of wood. I measure the thickness of all this wood. I get ready to do something with this wood. I put it on and I forget to do something. It would be something silly like. Uh, uh, Jerry would never do this, but it would be like, you know, reloading and forgetting to put uh, gunpowder in the casing. Okay. I haven't yet. And I'm like, <laughs> I've made these mistakes. So my learning then, every time I walk in the door to the shop, it's there to remind me that I have not perfected everything and I am still needing to be taught. One of these days you'll go in into the learning bin and make something beautiful out of what's there. I really hope I can because some of that work was expensive and I'd like to be able to repurpose it anyway. So any comments about the first three here? We have the um, we have the word of wisdom, we have the word of knowledge, and we have faith. That faith is the faith that miracles can actually happen. Okay? Number four. Next page. Okay, it should be on slide number four. The gifts of healing. That was mentioned earlier when I said, uh, what kind of gifts? Okay? So, um, not that I'm promoting this. I've watched it. Okay, this is a personal choice on my part. Uh, but I have watched uh, a good portion of the series, The, the Chosen. And in there, they have elaborated on some of the gatherings where Jesus is moving with his disciples. And all of these people come and Jesus is healing them. I mean, of every kind of thing that you can think of. And through the process of that, it shows his humanity, how he would come and they would have prepared a place for him to rest. And he basically um, takes off his sandals, acknowledges that, uh, that it's a blessing from God. He thanks God. He prays to God. He cleans himself and he collapses. He collapses. Mm -hmm. Because it took so much time to do so much. It is the ability to heal all kinds of sickness. This says this in Matthew 10. And verse 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits and cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So we're talking about every kind of disease that there was. You know, they had cancer back then too. They had leprosy. They had diseases that had caused blindness, deafness, Leprosy, if it's not taken care of, it is treatable today, by the way. Um, but it can cause your appendages to be lost, your nose, your ears. It, to, it destroys skin, tissue. It's a horrible thing, but they have the ability to heal that. And Jesus, in that example I gave, he would do, and it would be a long line as far as you could see in the episode. And it, I never thought of it that way. And it was the reality of seeing, my goodness, they were, as far as you could see, there were people coming to him. Some of them on, on crutches, some of them being carried. So many situations, and he had mercy and grace, and he healed them. And obviously their lives have changed. And so many of them followed him, but also many of them also walked away. Now, when we talk about the working of miracles, now, this goes back to that uh, original section that we looked at there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, 
The working of miracles is the miracles of extraordinary power. Give me an example. Other than the feeding of 5,000 and 4,000. Okay. Um, the wedding feast in John 2. Um, Mom comes to him. We run out of wine. It's, it's embarrassing. Uh, we know the family. Um, woman, what has this got to do with me? My time has not yet come. But he loved his mama and he still took care of things. He turned water into not just wine, by the way. But of that day, it was considered the very best. Very best. Give me another extraordinary <coughs> Gethsemane. On Gethsemane, there was another extraordinary thing happening. Remember? Okay, that's, that's in the garden when he put Malchus's ear back on. He's walking out to the boat from where he had been praying. And he's walking on the water. They think he's a ghost. And uh, anyway, there's a conversation. Peter says, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come and I'll come. And out of the boat. So a miraculous, extraordinary, by the power of God, Jesus made it so. His faith was in the one that called him, and he steps out, and Peter walked on water. Mm -hmm. Jesus is walking on water. Don't go out and try to do that this afternoon. <laughs> it's probably not going to end well. Um, coming to the storm, walking on water, Peter walked on water. Um, extraordinary miracles, what else? Okay. So the brethren are praying that he would be preserved. And the shackles fall off. They have been beaten, by the way. And they're in the deepest part of the prison. And the door's all open. They didn't have electronic locks, so let's just cover that. Every door popped open. Their bounds, uh, their, their bindings are loose. What, uh, the guy that's responsible for all of them, let's call him cell block one keeper. Uh, what does he do when he wakes up from his nap? There's a little story there. The guards should never nap. Uh, that's a side note. Um, and they use that biblical example, even though they may not believe in the Bible, but they use that as an example in the jail when they um, when they train police officers. They're singing. They're praising God. Everybody's listening. And the brethren out, outside the prison are praying, and boom, they're free. Incredible. Extraordinary miracle. What else? Raising of Lazarus. Lazarus. Not the day, but four days in John 11. Who is in the tomb. The, the stone is in place. He's wrapped and bound. His body would be uh, it would not be pleasant. And Jesus specifically says in a cemetery full of lots of dead people Lazarus come forth. You ever thought about why he only said Lazarus? Everybody would have come. Lazarus come forth. He comes. He says I'm buying him. And that's an incredible miracle. Any others? Ah. Oh. Talitha Kunche. Rana's child. You, uh, life is within you. That is an incredible. Absolutely. So we're talking about the working of miracles. Miracles of extraordinary power. These are the kind of things that even the disciples were given the ability to do. Tell me what prophecy is. Prophecy is.
listed as a spiritual gift. Okay, forward telling. That's a good way. I love that word. Um, in this context, it's the inspired disclosure of the future, that which is unknown to happen. That's the kind of stuff that uh, Isaiah did, like in Isaiah uh, chapter 6 through chapter 9, when he, wow, I can't believe it, uh, that he talked about the Christ being born to a virgin. Uh, that's prophetic, that's prophecy. The ability to speak in that way um, was relative to what we're talking about. So next week we'll pick up right there on slide number four and I'll keep going. If there's any questions about any of these, make sure you let me know so that I can address questions at the beginning of class, okay? Oh, I am not teaching. Thank you so much. See, I'm already in this mode. Um, uh, next week, Family Sunday, we will have Tim Neal and his family here. Tim is uh, a candidate for the pulpit position. He will be teaching Bible class and he will be uh, doing, uh, bringing the sermon message of the hour. Uh, then we'll have an opportunity to visit with him during fellowship and his family. I forgot. Thank you for setting me straight, Jeanette. Okay, we're done.